would like to say good evening to everyone. Amen. Amen. Certainly it is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Amen. You know, I um I been walking with the Lord now for a little while. And I learned so far and still learning that God makes no mistakes. We don't understand him. We don't always agree with him. But he's wise. He's kind. And so as we look at tonight's lesson, as you see the handouts, we're going to talk about communion with God through prayer. Communion with God through prayer. Now, before many of my educators take out your big red pens, let me go ahead and give you a disclaimer. I have some grammatical errors. Amen. Even though your pen may be red, let me remind you, so is his blood. Don't we come on a multitude of sins? Amen. <laughs> now, if you have your Bibles, let us go to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, you see chapter 13. They're on the handout, the first page. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 14th verse. Read from the NIV. It says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My brothers and sisters, many of us can testify here tonight that when we pray, we communicate with God. That is communication. All of us talk to God. Morning, noon, night. When we need something, when somebody else needs something, we talk to God. How many of y'all talk to God today? How many of you talk to God while you're driving down the street? Praying that somebody don't hit you or you don't hit somebody. How many of y'all really pray to God for your children? Watch over them because sometimes they're too busy with this thing called life they don't have time to pray. Right. So we always in constant communication with God. We're always talking to him. But what I discover is that we don't commune with him. We talk to him. He talks back to us. But we don't always commune with him. Meaning simply fellowship. And so the true meaning of communion is to share. When you are in a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you are sharing with him and he is sharing with you. And that is a sense of communion, which means, you know, a five dollar word for there's some fellowship going on. All right. Are y'all hearing me tonight, family? There is some fellowship going on. And whenever you're talking to God and God is talking to you, there should always be some fellowship going on. Am I right about it? All right. Fellowship is going on. So, when we look at what Paul is saying in chapter 13, we look at the overall theme, he comes back to the church at Corinth. He's getting out of here. If you look at verse 1, he tells them how he beseeched them, he greets them, but he lets them know. I have been to you before. This is not the first time we've been together. This is not the first time I've talked to you. I've written you. I've visited you. And now I'm telling you farewell. But before I tell you farewell, I'm telling you to get yourself together. Y'all hear me, church? God is telling us through Brother Paul 
Somebody who had problems himself. Mm -hmm. Somebody who didn't always dot every I and cross every T. And I'm pretty sure he had some grammatical errors. Mm -hmm. Telling us to make sure that most of all, we get ourselves together through love, yeah. in love, but most of all, in prayer. Church, whatever you do, don't stop praying. Mm -hmm. If you are a believer of God and do not pray, I question the validity of your Christianity. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because God wants to always talk with you. Let's look at this example. This is what Adam and Eve experienced with, uh, with God at the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. Every day, God will come and walk with them, right? Mm -hmm. That's fellowship. Not just talk with them, but hang out with them. Yes, when was the last time you hung out with God? Y'all yes, hear me, family? When was the last time you hung out with God? Talk with Him. Say, Lord, not my will, but let thy will be done. When was the last time you say, God, what is on your agenda for my life? Because I know my desire. I know my goal. You even said in your word, I know the plans you have for me. But what is it that you want me to do? What is it that you want me to say? Amen? He says, he says, and, 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 and it's amazing because uh, every day God will come and walk with them in the garden. Adam and Eve were like super beings glowing with the glory of God. And when they sin, they fell out of that relationship with the Father. And when God came looking for them, they were hiding because all the glory of God had now gone from them and they were ashamed. And this is one of the saddest moments in Scripture because we as humans have fallen out of that relationship and that fellowship uh, which is so deeply nourishing and important and is very integral uh, to us. Adam and Eve sinned and fell out of the presence of God. Whenever you sin, you are falling out of the presence of God. And you do know what sin is, don't you? Yes, sir. Right? Some will say it's missing the mark. I would simply say it's self-inflicted nonsense. That's what it is. Because some sins are afflicted upon us, and then there are some sins that are inflicted upon our sins. Right. So it's self-inflicted nonsense. It's when we step out of his will and make our wants our priority. Amen, somebody? And the biggest mistake we make in our lives is saying, God, I know your will, but my want is more important. That's why some of us are still sin. That's why our churches are empty. It's because we're not willing to sacrifice our own self-needs. Yes, yes, he said, if you're going to be in Christ, you're a new creature. And the old things pass away. Hold all things become new. And if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you have to deny yourself. Wait a minute. That's something I don't really want to do. Adam and Eve sinned, fell out of presence. So God had to implement the consequences of their disobedience. And it meant separation between him and us. Right. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go anywhere my God cannot go. Yeah. I need God with me every day. Every minute, every second. I don't hear nobody in here. Anybody need God like that? I need him right now. I'm looking at you, look at me, and I need God. You hear me? That's, that's, that, that's how it is. We, we have to realize that we cannot make it without him. I can't breathe without him. I cannot walk without him. I cannot think without him. I can't live without him. So if I want to get closer to God, I have to communicate. But I need to be in communion. And I'm just not talking about that wafer. And that little bit cup of juice that we drink on the first side. I'm talking about when we wake up in the morning, the Bible said that men should always what? Pray. Pray. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. He said that you should always pray without what? Ceasing. Meaning that you're not stopping. Meaning every time you turn around, you should be praying. Yeah. 
Because whenever you're not talking to God, that means Satan is talking to you. Amen, hey somebody. There's only one or the other. There is no in between. Either you talking to him or Satan is talking to you. And he talks in many different shapes, forms, and fashions. So as we look at page two, it says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to what? Help us in our time of need. He said, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, right? So that we may receive what? Mercy and find what? That unmerited favor that we do not deserve. Can there anybody in here testify that we don't deserve God's grace? Yeah. I need somebody who was out there bad night, you up and you're good. You can testify. Yeah. Uh, I need to talk to some of y'all who used to hang out over there at Mr. A's club. Yeah. Yeah. And you can testify that you ain't always dotted every I and crossed every T. Yeah. Say amen, somebody. Oh, I'm from here. I know where the hung out at. I need to talk to those who can testify. I've been to Lockwood Skating Ring on Saturday night and stayed there after 10 o'clock when we took off the stakes and started dancing. Good God Almighty. I need His grace and His mercy. That unmerited favor to help us in our time of need. Let's not see God for what He can do for us, but let's see God for who He is. His throne. Judgment, but a throne of grace which pardons us and overlooks the sin in our life. In other words, somebody said, He looked beyond my what? Thoughts. And He saw my needs. Anybody here can testify to say, You know what, Brother Richard? Yeah, there's some stuff that God knows about me that nobody else knows. Says, this is how 
It is. So when you pray, you may find yourself wanting more time to be in his presence, and you'll find that his presence in your life will satisfy you and fulfill you in the deepest ways. Prayer needs to be a habit. Daily practice where we learn what it is to walk with God, opening up to him, communing with him, and talking with him. Amen? Amen. Now, can I say this? God talks through his word. Amen. If you ain't told it out your mouth. Yeah. Huh? He, he's been talking some 2,000 plus years. How do you know that? The whole world is in existence because he started talking. Yeah. You don't believe it? The Bible said in the beginning. God created. Ain't that what happened? And what I said, and he said what? Let there what? That means he what? He spoke. And what was nothing became something. And that's why you're here today. All of us in here are nothing. And because he spoke into our lives, or somebody spoke the word into our lives, and water does, and we became something. So here it is on page three. I want to get you out of here before the heat of the night come on. I just love that bill of less pity. James 5, 16 through 18. What, what they say, somebody help me, help me. Uh huh.
sometimes you walk and you trip. But the Bible says he is able to keep you from falling. Yeah. So sometimes you walk and you trip. Are you hearing me? And the reason why you haven't fallen yet is because Jesus is bothering you the whole way. Y'all hear me? Because the prayer of the righteous person is powerful. And it is effective. Elijah was a human being. And even as we are, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Am I right about it? And it did not rain on the land for what? Three and a half years. And then what happened? And again he prayed, and the heavens gave what? Rain. God allowed the clouds to move over the ocean and absorb it, the mist, and then move the cloud over to the spot which was dry and needed moisture. Come on. That's the type of God that we serve. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah, that he waters us when we need it the most. Yeah. The Bible is filled with promises, encouragements, and illustrations, which emphasizes the secret of effective prayer. It said that James had knees that were worn down by his constant habit of what? Kneeling and praying. So, so we have the testimony of a man who had proved the secret of effective prayer in his life. And he practiced what he preached. But notice the statement he makes in verse 16. He said that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and it is what? Effective. In other words, he's saying it gets what? Results. And whenever you pray, you want some results. I don't want to be just talking. I'm talking to God because I want some results. Amen, somebody. Oh, bless his name. I want some results. I want God to move some mountains. I want God to shake things up. I want to I want to be able to cry when there ain't nothing wrong with me. I want to be able to laugh and ain't nothing funny. You hear me? I want to be a clapping and there's no reason why I'm clapping because that's the God that we serve. That's what I want to be able to do. So look here, we're going to go to page four. He said, now this kind of prayer, which is not always or very rarely, or it is ineffective. It's going to be ineffective. The reason the prayer is ineffective and useless is because God does not hear. Somebody look up and compare Job 27, verse 8 from 9 and read that. And then Job 35 and 10 and 13. God is when he is cut off. When God requires his life. When God hears his cry, when the spirit comes upon him. He said, what else? Say it again, Job 27, verse 8, 9. What did he say? But what is the hope of the God when he is cut off? Hold on, baby, take that thing down so I can hear you. But what is the hope of the what? God. Of the God who? Less. 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 Meaning the person who has decided not to be what? Connected to him. Meaning the one that has not been in what? Communion what? With him. The man who has not been what? Communicated with him. What happens to him? He been what? The Bible says he been what? Can I ask you a question? <coughs> Have you been cut off? Huh? No. Have you been cut off? No. Have you ever been cut off before? No. Good God Almighty. But notice, he says, prayer with a wrong motive, huh? <coughs> Cannot be what? Effective. We learned this from James 4 and 3. And how often we pray what? Selfishly. Only prayer which is offered for the glory of God secures his ear and his answer. In other words, you have to watch what you pray for. Watch who you pray for. Okay, let me go over here and borrow this in mind. I know we all learned it when we was young because all of y'all look young. You ain't old, you're just seasoned. Oh, I'm going to say this, you ain't nothing but a recycled teenager. Go. <laughs> he, he, said, he said, when you pray to him, he said, you pray this now. He said, I will what? Oh. Which are what? Yeah. He said, now I like how Jesus said that because he said, first of all, I'm letting you know how I address them too. Yeah. Jesus said, just because I've been hanging with them all 
all these years don't yes. mean I disrespect who yes. he is. Yes. It's an album fault. Yes. I like that. Then he lets you know where he is. He says, if you ain't here, he there, he everywhere, but he's in where? Yes. Hollywood, how excellent. Hallelujah. And that's something, it's your what? It's your what? Your name, right? When we talk to God, we need to reference him for who he is. And he said, when we do that, we have this ear. That's not the first time in the Bible when God gave somebody his ear. Okay, can I share it with you? In the book of Psalms 40, David said, I waited patiently. And the Lord inclined his ear to me. Which means, he said, the Lord bent down his ear. And this is what he did. He said, he put his ear not to my mouth, because a pair of lips will say anything. But he put his ear to my heart. You hear what I'm saying, baby? He said, he put his ear to my heart, and he heard me, and he lifted me up out of the miry place, out of a pit of loneliness and depression. So when you don't pray selfishly, and when you pray earnestly, and when you really asking God to move, he will move on your behalf. Why is that? Because you're not selfishly, and you know what you're praying for, and you got his ear, and when you got his ear, you got his heart. We got to quit being selfish, only one was in God's hand, but not was in his heart. So, and he says, if we know of sin in our lives, prayer cannot be effective. We learn this from Psalms 66 and 18. He said, how easy it is to harbor what? Sin. He said, we need to pray the prayers that David prayed in Psalms 139, 23, and 24. Even when he prayed in Psalms 51, verses 3 and 4, and even an act on 1 John 1 and 9. Are you hearing me, loved ones? Baby, he said, don't you harbor that stuff on the inside of you? Then he said, an unforgiving spirit yeah. will hinder prayer. Yeah. Ooh, let me talk to you real quick. Yeah. I'm talking about the one that ain't talking to that cousin because you didn't get your piece of the pie after the funeral. Let me talk to you. Let me talk to you. Because you think you run everything and everybody because you got the degree. Let me talk to you. But that unclean spirit of unforgiveness on you. Ain't that something when the Bible says, how can you say you love God? Who you have what? Not sin, but hate your brother. Who you see every day. Therefore, they classify you as a liar. Huh? And he said, a liar shall not what? know that if we have an unforgiving spirit, now we learn this from Mark chapter 11, verse 25 through 26. Is this a possible reason why our prayers for the conversion of our loved ones are not being answered just yet? Because we have an unforgiving spirit? Is it seem like that one son or daughter, that one niece or nephew, that one great time, you've done the best you can with it. But there's, there's, a, there's a spirit that is of unlovingness and unforgiveness that it seems like there can't nobody break through. And it is hindering you from being what God wants you to be. When you're in communion with God through prayer, these things happen. There is, however, a kind of prayer which is always effective. James tells us that it is possible to pray and to succeed in gaining God's gracious answer to our prayers. Right. This is the prayer that is powerful mm -hmm. and effective. Right. And James gave, uh, goes on to give us an illustration of what prayer can do. In verse 17 and 18, if we want to discover the secret of effective prayer and all that God is willing to do in answer prayers, 
if his people, he said, we need to look at Elijah, a man just like us, who proved the great power of prayer in an amazing way. As we look at Elijah, we should ask the question, what prayer can do? Yeah. In other words, I'm going to say this. We always hear all the time, prayer changes stuff. Right? Yeah. I believe that if prayer don't change just the thing, yeah. it'll change you. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It'll change you from the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Am I right, Bob? Yeah. Okay. Paul said it like this the other day. Please forgive me. I split birds and run on sentences from here now, okay? Uh, I, 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 I live in the country, but if you know the truth, some of y'all are from the country, now you move to the city. You know what I'm about? <laughs> he said this. He says, and that was given to me. Woo, good God Almighty. Yeah. I wish I had time to deal with that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But he said that was given. When you give somebody something, I mean it's a gift, right? Yes, oh, good God Almighty. He said it was given to me. What? A thorn in my what? In my flesh, in my side, right? To what? Buffet me. And it's something, it, it was a constant reminder of things for me. And he said, I asked the Lord to remove it since he got a sense of humor, since he passed and I gifts. He gave me a thorn, child. That buffeted me. And that's something. He gave me a thorn to buffet me. And I asked the Lord to do what? Remove it. And he said, uh uh. -oh. Deal with it, child. Uh -oh. I ain't taking nothing from you. But guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you some grace. To deal with it. Ain't you glad that God has given you some grace to deal with it? I know it hurt. I know you still cry. I know you still deal with it. I know you don't want to be bothered sometimes. But God has given you grace. Somebody else. All right. Am I right about it? Through prayer, God's servants experience his miracle working power. Yeah. 